of the uh, Green County Democratic Party's uh, town hall meetings that we've been doing, just trying to uh, educate on a couple of different issues. Tonight's uh, issue is health care for everyone. One of the uh, basic things that we think is that people shouldn't die in a ditch because they can't afford health insurance. Um, so there are a couple of different ways of getting there. Uh, tonight we're planning on taking a look at some of the things that have been done in the past, what's going on right now, and what a lot of, we're hearing a lot of right now on what's going to happen next, what the next step is. So uh, first gonna have Mike Miller talk, uh, kind of the history of Medicare. And uh, Mike, you wanna see what you got? Uh, good evening. It's um, good evening. Good evening. Oh, there, there we are. There, everybody's awake. Um, um, okay. Um, before we get started, I'd like to give you a web page, and that web page is kff.org. Okay. Uh, that was part of uh, my research in preparing for tonight. And I would recommend it to you as a source for uh, really nonpartisan kind of ind independent information on health care. Okay? Questions? Yes, sir. KFF.org. Sam, Sam. Pardon me? Sam, Sam. No. Frank. Frank, Frank. It stands for Kaiser Family Foundation. Oh. Dot org, but it's KFF is their web page. Okay. Okay. It's um. Let's go ahead and get started. It's um. It's 1965. Okay. It's 1965, and President Johnson has just signed into law the first Medicare law. Okay. Now, when President Johnson did that, it had been worked on since the 40s. But indicative of the background of, of uh, Medicare, uh, he gave the first Medicare card to a Missourian, uh, Harry Truman. Okay? I thought that was appropriate. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, at the time, at the time, uh, seniors were the population group which was most likely to be living in poverty. About a half of seniors had no health care insurance. In 1966, July 1, folks started signing up for Medicare. And by the end of the, of the sign-up period, 19 million had signed up for Medicare. Okay. We've seen a number of improvements and expansion of Medicare over the years. Uh, I'm going to highlight just some of those, okay? In, uh, in 1972, Medicare eligibility was extended to individuals under the age of 65 with long-term disabilities. Okay? That's no longer a, a health care for the aged program. Now it's health care for the ages, aged and for those with disabilities under age 65. Okay? Also covered were uh, individuals with end-stage renal disease, ESRD. <clears throat> Medicare was given the authority to conduct demonstration programs. And you'll see as we talk, they've had a number of successful demonstration programs. Moving forward, in 1980, Medicare started covering hospice, okay? That's a question, I'm a volunteer, and that's a question that I get quite frequently is, is hospice covered? And the answer is yes. Okay. Now, Medicare started out and still covers approximately 
of your health care cost, 80%. In addition, uh, the agency which is responsible for enrolling you in Medicare is Social Security Administration. Okay? And needless to say, panelists, if I say anything you disagree with, please stop me, okay? Because <laughs> I may be wrong. Okay? <clears throat> the, uh, the, the Medicare hospice benefit was established as an option for beneficiaries to receive all-inclusive care to relieve pain and manage symptoms in a home environment. Moving further forward, in 1986, Medicare coverage for pregnant women and infants up to one years of age for up to an income level of up to 100% of the federal poverty level was established as a state option. Okay, that's, that's a further deviation from a program for senior health care. Now, we've started covering people with disabilities below the age of 65, and now we're covering lower income people. Okay, that's often lost in the discussion. Okay. Yes. When pregnant women and babies up to one year old started being covered, is that when it... Uh, was that called Medicaid or was that called Medicaid? Um, that's Medicaid. That's Medicaid. That Medicaid. I believe so it's, that was yeah. So that we don't confuse them any more than we already are, let's, let's talk about, we're going to say Medicare. Medicaid is a program principally focused on low income people. Okay? The brochures that you have at your seat, okay? Let me call those to your attention. Uh, first off, uh, there's uh, pay less for Medicare. That's about helping folks that are low income. Save money on Medicare prescription drugs. That's free for helping people on low income with their Part D costs. Okay? And then you have a brochure which looks like this, which is for claim. And we're coming up on claim here. We're, we're at 1986. We're coming up on claim. Uh, yes, claim was formed by law in 1993. In 1993, Congress added a provision in law which creates a SHIP, S-H-I-P, in every state in the nation. Claim is the SHIP in the state of Missouri. I'm one of 300 volunteers for claim. Okay? In 1998, the internet site Medicare.gov was added. Okay? We think of that now as pretty ubiquitous, but um, these additions just happened over time. In uh, 1999, the first annual, the first annual Medicare and You was published. Okay, now every person on Medicare gets one of these every year. Okay. Uh, also, we're now in 1999. Uh, the toll-free number 1-800 Medicare became available nationwide. Okay, in 19, excuse me, 2001, Secretary Tommy Thompson renamed the Healthcare Financing Administration. Now, that, that's a, an institution I'd never heard of. Uh, and that uh, changed that name to the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, CMS. Okay, that's what it's known as today. Uh, probably most of you. Uh, are not on of um, Medicare age and you don't realize the payment system that CMS uses is regionalized and here in the state of Missouri our payments for Medicare services are handled by Wisconsin Physician Services WPS okay most people don't know that okay okay 
uh, let's move forward. Uh, 2001, uh, beneficiaries with incomes less than 150% of the federal poverty level became eligible for sub subsidies under the new Part D program. Let's move forward to 2005. Enrollment started for the Medicare Prescription Drug Program, Part D. Okay? 2005. Moving further forward, in 2011, 3.6 million people with Medicare saved 2.1 billion on their prescription drugs. Yeah, that's in one year. More than 25.7 million beneficiaries in original Medicare received at least one preventative service following one of those Medicare examples where they were doing a test, okay? There is now an entire brochure that we have which provides people uh, preventative programs. That was 2011. Now, as we went through the years with all of these expansions and improvements of Medicare, most of them were treated with uh, a great deal of skepticism and a lot of, uh, I'll say, overheated rhetoric. Um, here's a, an example uh, of that overheated uh, rhetoric. Uh, write those letters now. Call your friends and then tell them to write also. If you don't, this program will be passed just as surely as the sun will come up tomorrow. And behind it will come other federal programs that will invade every area of freedom as we know it. And if you don't do this, and if I don't do it, one of these days, we are going to spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in America when men were free. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry to report that that was Ronald Reagan in 1961. Okay? That beloved grandfather, okay? Uh, um, so there's a lot of overheated rhetoric around there, okay? Uh, so, it's 2019, where are we? Well, uh, as of 2018, uh, there are 60 million, 60 million Medicare beneficiaries. 40 million of those, of those beneficiaries have traditional Medicare. Now, if they have traditional Medicare, remember that's, that's, that's 80%. So most of that 20, most of the 40 million have also a, have a supplement or some, some, some health care coverage through an employer that help handles that 20%, okay? In addition, there are 20 million people, 20 million in Medicare Advantage plans, okay? Now, that's the beauty of Medicare and you, which comes out each year, and this shows you that there are about 32 Medicare Advantage plans in the state of Missouri. And depending upon where you live, this book will tell you which ones you're eligible to join, okay? In addition, in the state of Missouri, there are 26 Part D plans that you can join. Okay. So I'll repeat my question, which 2019, where are we? Well, we've got these 60 million people. The average wage of those people in Medicare, average wage is $26,000 today. I happen to think that that fact should be repeated before any legislative body considers making any changes to this program. $26,000 is the average wage. Okay? And uh, something that I learned when I was researching this is over 75% of those people are satisfied with their health care coverage. Okay? okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. One thing that I did forget to mention at the start, 
the way we've been handling these um, is if you have any questions, that's what the note cards are for. If you don't mind writing it down on the note card and passing it up to me, and then we'll get it, we'll kind of funnel them that way. We don't uh, we don't get repeat questions, and, and it kind of helps uh, eliminate some of the soapboxing that some folks like to do. Uh, Debbie Green is a current insurance agent. He works a lot with uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, whatever you want to call it. So if you want to talk about that, thank you very much. Alrighty. Well, I'm a retired certified financial planner. I did that for 25 years and um, <laughs> thank you. So anyway, yeah, retired from certified financial planning. And then the last five, well, for 30 years now, I've helped people with health insurance. And the last five years has been the Affordable Care Act mostly. And there's so many people that want to go back. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it was great before, but you know what? selling health insurance for 25 years I'd sell 8 10 15 plans a month but the couple years before the Affordable Care Act I sold zero plans in like two years I could not get one person through underwriting and if I could get them through underwriting it was too freaking expensive nobody could afford it before the Affordable Care Act it was not great back then so anyway um I just kind of wanted to talk about where we are right now and right now there is just one option. A lot of people don't realize that um, it's and better. And my biggest concern and the few agents that are left doing this, all the navigators are gone or most of them are gone because all the funding is destroyed. The navigators like 90% of the funding is gone. So there's a few of us agents left making anywhere from four to $6 a month for helping people. I do it because I absolutely love it and I think it's just essential you know and I help like 80 to 90 families right now and probably half of those would not have coverage if it wasn't somebody like me helping them because there are so many hoops and they'd give up um, but doing this every day makes it easy for us to get people through underwriting but um, so basically there there is and better and the Affordable Care Act has has been just such a godsend for people like individuals making from 12 to twenty four thousand dollars a year it is phenomenal. Um, the premiums are anywhere from zero to thirty or forty dollars a month, and the most somebody would be out of pocket is like twelve hundred dollars. I mean, excellent coverage and go anywhere on it and better now as far as Mercy or Cox. So as far as keep your doctor, it's way better than it was before. You can go to anybody in town and then about seven different states um, where we run into problems though and the other thing that keeps me up at night is when you get the individual that makes like forty eight thousand dollars a year it can cost them like twenty to twenty two thousand dollars for premiums and and out of pockets that's like almost half of their income so so the cliffs are still a problem with with Obamacare and then people like if someone comes in and says, yeah, I make about $12,000 a year, then they're not going to get any help at all because they don't quite make enough. So then it takes somebody like me to say, well, do you ever work overtime? Let's say twelve one fifty, dollars and you're in. So, um, and, and the rules allow us to do that. So basically, you have to know your way around a tax return to be able to help people with, <laughs> with the Affordable Care Act. And... Um, Mostly, what it's doing it is helping people from around twelve to twenty-five or thirty thousand. Over that, it, we just start running into cliffs as far as premiums skyrocketing or, or going up. So it's like a mm, couple hundred dollars a month, and a lot of people can't afford that. And then six thousand dollar out of pockets if somebody needed surgery or something. And those numbers are are harder for people to deal with. Um, like during the year right now usually I just work during open enrollment but if like a husband and wife are retiring they will call me up and be like okay we just need something we're retiring we make about 70,000 a year find us some insurance so we talk about the and better plan they're like well that's too expensive we just need something catastrophic just find us something cheaper it's like there's nothing else there is nothing else. <laughs> That's why this young lady's <laughs> gonna help us move forward because the Affordable Care Act has been fantastic for, for a group of people, but it's not doing it for everybody. A um, Couple things I wanted to hit on. So uh, of the 80 families that I help, the, the highly subsidized ones are doing fantastic on Obamacare. Other than that, I've written absolutely nobody full price because nobody had had enough money to pay for it. I'm budgeting eighteen thousand dollars 
for my own personal health insurance and out-of-pockets if the Affordable Care Act goes away in January? Or what if Ann Better says, we're not doing Missouri anymore? Claire's idea, Claire McCaskill, she got defeated, of course, and, and now, I mean, she, she assured everybody, I'm going to fight like mad to get everybody on the plan that we have as senators. So it's like, thanks, you know, at, at least you have an idea if we lose our our option but like I said it, next no um, October if Ann better says we're not doing insurance we don't know what we're gonna do you know th there won't be anything to buy for any price even for my eighteen thousand dollars a year there will be nothing to buy um, besides MediShare which is a Christian sharing thing it's th there's some pros and cons to MediShare it's not health insurance it's a Christian sharing plan some people have used that so I've got eight people that are on MediShare and 80 families that are highly subsidized zero bought full price coverage um, like I said I still have people looking for catastrophic coverage in it there is none everything has to all coverage has to include the the 10 essential benefits, which is great because you don't have to read the fine print about what's not covered. Everything's covered anymore. anymore. The doctor visits um, prescriptions, ER, mental health, hospital, rehab, preventive care, labs, pediatric, maternity. Everything has to be covered under all plans now. Um, one thing that Trump did do is he extended the short-term plans. They have gotten so awful it's just not to be believed. It's like if you no pre-existing conditions are covered and then if you get a pre-existing condition on one of these plans then it's called a pre-existing condition so if anything else comes with that then it's not covered either and um, I read one where the limit on surgery is seven thousand dollars a lot of surgeons won't get out of bed for seven thousand um, dollars you know another problem with the Affordable Care Act is called the family glitch and that means uh, or deemed affordable is kind of what we call it like if I work for a company and it's only $200 for me and that's less than 10% of the family income but it's $1,500 to, to cover my husband and kids then it's deemed affordable because it's affordable for me so we don't some of those families are going ahead and getting pushed onto the Affordable Care Act even the rules say they shouldn't be on it because there is something else available it's not affordable so a lot of those families were, were kind of getting on anyway and we'll, we'll see what happens um, and just kind of an aside and again I think something that Rebecca's gonna gonna hit on and Mike did 17 to 50 million dollars is is what the CEOs of, of some of these companies make. Centene, I think, is like $24 million. The head of Cigna makes $50 million a year. It's about a million dollars a week. It's about $200,000 a day. I think it's freaking ridiculous. Uh, maybe it's just me, but uh, just think of the profit these companies have to make to pay one person's salary. This thing is so profit-driven still, it's insane. Um, that's why Centene and Aetna and Cigna, none of these companies do the Affordable Care Act anymore. They've all gone just to the MedSups. I can write MedSups by 15 different companies. And again, it's just Ambetter, which is Centene now, um, for the Affordable Care Act. So if you guys have any questions, I've been doing this since, since ground level on it. Um, it about takes somebody with my background in finances to get people on and to stay on um, it seems like about everybody there too that works for the Affordable Care Act there aren't very many people left there either I mean it's taken six and seven months to get to get my people actually approved they're they're on and they're covered health wise but then the approval of their incomes and all that is just taking like six months so anyway um, a lot still needs to be done and hopefully Rebecca's got some ideas here but if you have any specific questions I'd be happy to answer them we'll get, we'll get come back on questions okay. thank you very much all right Rebecca is with Missouri health care for all and like I said there are how many different Medicare for all proposals going on right now yeah, so Rebecca's going to kind of knock those down to about four major, yeah, <laughs> and uh, see what we have with those. Thank you. 
Hey there, guys. Um, I'm a little shorter than everyone. Um, my name is Rebecca Johnson, and I'm the Springfield organizer for Missouri Healthcare for All. And what we do is we advocate for better health care for every Missourian across the state. And we believe that everyone should have access to quality, affordable health care, no matter how much money they make or which region of the state they live in. Um, so with that, I kind of want to go to um, where we are at as a state. Awesome, it worked, cool. Um, kind of, this is the breakup of where people are getting their health care from. Most people are in our state are getting like their health care through their employer. Um, next following that is Medicare, and it's, I, for me, it looks like it's all one big chunk, but Medicaid is right after that. Um, though that, these numbers are from 2017, and as of 2018, the Medicaid numbers should be at least 100,000 below because there have been massive purges of the Medicaid program um, just almost by clerical error because these people were eligible and just dropped. So the Medicaid numbers should be much lower and the uninsured much higher. Um, I'll go on to that more a little bit, but that's an aside. Um, and then non-group plans that are not a part of an employer plan, that's kind of the catch-all for everyone else. And then the military and VA cover about 2%. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, so state changes. Um, we do a lot of initiatives to lobby our legislators to make changes that they can control. So not necessarily uh, you know, making massive changes to Medicare or the VA, but we can do a lot of things as far as consumer protections. Um, so we've passed protections such as protecting people from surprise bills they may get in the emergency room, um, as well as rate review, which requires insurance companies to explain why did your rates go up by 30% this year? They have to explain that and report it to the state. Um, we've also um, just stop, tried to stop those short-term plans you talked about. Some of them are very ridiculous, sometimes as ridiculous as if you got sick or hurt on a weekend, they wouldn't take your claim because you got sick on a weekend. So just don't do anything on the weekends, apparently. Um, we also work to improve the Medicaid program, which is very just shoestring in our state. Um, it is very difficult to qualify for Medicaid. and. Um, by some miracle in 2018, we were able to extend care for from like as soon as new moms have their kiddo, then they are kicked off their Medicaid. But we extended that to a year for moms who are also seeking to um, have treatment from substance abuse. So in addition to being a new parent, they also have the pressure of facing their addiction. So somehow <laughs> we got the legislators to pass that almost mini expansion for that very specific subset, which is still great because that's 1,200 moms who will benefit from that and their families as well. Um, of course, we're always trying to stop budget cuts to existing health programs that we have going on. We are not always successful, but we are always looking to try and raise that coverage as much as we can. Um, we also, this year, pa we blocked the legislature from imposing Medicaid work requirements, which would ask Medicaid recipients to report all of their work. Um, and if they didn't, if there was any error with that, then they would just get kicked off of their Medicaid coverage, which is ridiculous because we can't even keep track of the people who are already eligible, but I digress. Um, so I'm really glad that you guys talked about Medicare and the ACA because I kind of want to, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, but with Medicare, I saw this a couple months ago in December and it was just striking to me because on this side we have our, you know, life expectancy compared to peer nations. We're number 17, we stay pretty close there. But as soon as we hit 65 and the years right after, we skyrocket and we keep skyrocketing. And that, I believe, is because of the great success of the Medicare program. Everyone, I mean, I know that there are issues. I know people who've had issues with it, but overall, that doesn't lie. That does not lie, you know. So, um, this is kind of why we do what we do. We try and make these improvements on the statewide level, and we are gonna keep making those improvements and changes because they do affect our neighbors and make lives better. Um, but we know that we cannot get to everyone. There's always gonna be a lapse in coverage. We have a huge coverage gap with how hard it is for people to um, get those ACA subsidies sometimes, but they also cannot qualify for Medicaid, and there are so many people in that middle ground. Um, so we believe at Missouri Healthcare for All that we need to have a system that would truly cover everyone 
and we have some ideas of what that would look like. Um, we came up with these things called the pillars. They are kind of standards by which we'll evaluate um, proposed systems, which there are at least 10. I'm gonna just keep it to a couple today. Um, but what we really wanna see is an integrated system. Whenever we are trying to balance all of these insurance companies, doctors and nurses are taking on a lot of the work of the paperwork. They're not doing the job that they're trained to do and love. They're spending more time filling out paperwork and trying to fight for their patients to have care and fighting these battles with insurance companies. So we believe having an integrated system would be beneficial to everyone, especially our elected officials, because then they're held accountable in turn to make it a really great system because they're a part of it. Um, also the freedom to choose your provider. Um, when talking about Medicare for all, people are like, well, I really like what I have. We could have a true free market health system where people could just go to the doctor that they liked because they had the best care there. So there isn't necessarily a real truth to the fact that people would have to change their whole healthcare experience. It could just be simply go where you got the best care. And there's no insurance company that's restricting you or keeping you from getting like your favorite doctor. Um, economically sensible. We spend so much money in administrative costs. A lot of money goes to those insurance profits. Dollar salaries? Yep. Yep. Yes. And we, and the true cost of healthcare is already here and it's on us. It's on a lot of us and it has been for decades. Um, so we believe that if we strategically plan out how to pay for this and really benefit from those savings that are lost in those really high salaries, um, we could all benefit and we'd be a better society because of it. Um, affordable drugs and devices, we are the number one consumer of pharmaceuticals in the world. But drug prices are one of the number one complaints that I hear about from people all across the state. We don't have any kind of market control overall as a country over that, but if we were all together, then we would have a great like market piece, you know. So um, we also believe that they should be the most comprehensive plans that anyone could need. Of course, those ACA essentials are great, but we want to extend that to more. We want to extend it to you know, further mental health care, reproductive care, um, and covering those drugs and devices that are so expensive. Um, and also a focus on community health and equity. We need to be having conversations with people who are going to be um, you know, implementing this kind of system and know exactly what certain communities need to make sure that we are not leaving anyone out because of race or gender or geographic location. So that's kind of where we're coming from and what Missouri Healthcare for All would want to see change. So there are two main bills. Um, we are nonpartisan, by the way. Um, but these are the two main bills that currently are closest. Um, they're a House and Senate kind of counterpart. Um, they both would extend coverage greatly um, with like some of the things I talked about. And there are, all right, I might move around a bit just so I can see what you're seeing. <laughs> um, so these are a couple of the current proposals. Um, there actually was a hearing today for Representative Jayapal's plan. Um, I caught a little bit of it. Um, but basically, I looked at these through a couple things, like if it would extend coverage to everyone. Um, the Medicare for America plan, that is not Medicare for all. Um, that is more of a public plan option. Um, and the same for Medicare X as well. Um, I looked and I kind of cross-referenced through different articles and such, and um, all of them encourage coverage for everyone, though it does not, the Medicare X does not talk about incarcerated people, it actually explicitly excluded them, so I was just noting that. Um, comprehensive care, the first two have that comprehensive care covered. I didn't see anything left out. Um, but with Medicare for America, there wasn't any coverage talked about with reproductive care or long-term nursing care, which is very expensive part of our healthcare system. Um, and then Medicare X, it works kind of more as like an extended version of the ACA, I noticed. And so it really focused on those 10 essential benefits. Um, no cost to the patient. So uh, Senator Sanders, I found out I was surprised um, that his plan currently has out-of-pocket costs for drugs up to $200 a year. Um, so that was surprising. Um, there are a lot of people who want that changed, but of course, we're in the beginning stages of talking about this concept in, the con in Congress and the Senate. So 
Um, and then going on, it kind of, they also do not have a complete no cost to the patient at all. Um, mostly with the Medicare X, that would leave most people still paying for their health care. Um, but all of them had some kind of mechanism for putting a check on drug prices, which I think is very good. So a lot of people want to talk about how is this fiscally possible because it is a huge part of our economy. There are a lot of jobs and there's a lot of fear and uncertainty and insurance companies oftentimes and drug reps love to use that to their advantage about if people can't, if we could actually take this on. And a lot of independent studies have found that this honestly could bring us all in a better place and we could still come out even. Um, you know, of course, if we extended healthcare to everyone who doesn't have it, that's a lot of stress on the healthcare system. But with that, we also wouldn't have that administrative cost, which is about 30% of our healthcare economy. We wouldn't have the outrageous salaries that are, you know, just benefiting off of people being sick. Um, and so I kind of did some math, and I do have a source for this. Um, it's a great little study about the actual cost after 10 years. It is very hard to differentiate and figure out how this complex system would look. And this was the best that we have so far for talking about this. Um, with Medicare for All, it's said to be about $32 trillion after 10 years of being implemented. This is supposed to scare you, but currently it's supposed to be around $34 trillion after 10 years with our current healthcare system. But that's not including the rising health care costs, which puts it closer to $40 trillion. So actually, I'm of the position that we can't afford not to have Medicare for all. So, And, you know, everyone wants to talk about the mechanics of it and, oh, well, what if I lose something or, you know, I just love my employer insurance plan. But, you know, it's so much bigger than that. And one of the costs of our healthcare system remaining how it is, is her. Um, this was Natalie Sarkeesian. She had leukemia at the age of 14, and she needed to get a bone marrow transplant, and she did. She had good health insurance because, her, because of her father's job. Um, but after that, she had complications that arose, and she ended up needing to get a liver transplant because her liver was failing. Cigna brought in two of their own doctors to come and say, this is experimental. It can't be done. It's not, we're not going to cover it. Even though her doctors who had provided her care for years knew that this gave her a 65% shot. Um, public outcry rose up and through that pressure, they were able to make a compassion based exception. By the time they made that call, she died five hours later. And that's the cost of our healthcare system as it is. And so that's kind of why I really am passionate about not only talking about, you know, the great things that we have done, but also being willing to say we need more and we need to be more organized and do things better. So that's kind of all I had to say. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Rebecca, have you got your clicker here? That's someone asked that you go back to the oh. first graph and kind of show us where the uh, Affordable Care Act folks are. I broke it. Yep. So on that graph, where where do you see the Affordable Care the individually insured folks? Yes, that would be the non-group. Okay. Yeah. Th those are the individuals. Okay. Yes. Um, Rebecca, I think is next to her for you as well. Would you be able to explain what the single payer system is and how that would relate to Medicare, Medicare supplements, and Medicare Advantage plans? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, um, what single payer is? Single payer just means that there is one entity paying for health coverage. Um, that could be, you know, a government system 
or just your mom. Like it's that it's that simple. It's just one person is paying for that instead of you know Medicare is paying for 80 percent and then you're paying for the rest or your supplement plan is paying for that. Single payer just simplifies it to one person paying for health care. Um, and if we were to have Medicare for all, um, you know, from our pillars and what I would expect and hope, I would say that there wouldn't be a need for those Advantage plans because Medicare would be improved so much that that would all be a part of your healthcare experience. So, yeah. All right. Um, do you have any insight as far as why the state didn't follow up on the uh, letters that they sent out to the thousands of people who then got dropped from the Medicaid rolls because they didn't uh, follow, they didn't respond to those letters? Yeah, so with that, there were a lot of um, letters sent out, and I heard this from a legislative aide about, well, you know, if they were reached, if people had reached out to say, hey, you need to re-enroll and such, um, you know, people move. And the people who are benefiting from Medicaid are some of the busiest people that you will ever meet who are working multiple jobs. And so um, I don't know about you guys, but I do not always check my mail. But sometimes things just get sent or they don't get forwarded, even if you put in that you're moving and you need things forwarded. So there was a lot of room for clerical error with that. And yeah, it's quite despicable how many people have lost care just because of the program not actually reaching out to them in a timely manner also. All right, so kind of a question for all three of you, I think, but uh, see what you think. Would you agree the fastest way to bring about change in the healthcare system would be to eliminate employer-based insurance and require everyone to purchase insurance on the open market? Um, no, not until some of Re Rebecca's plans are available. Um, I think we're going to have to ease into any of these, and you've got a lot more uh, on how that's going to happen. Can you repeat the last part of that question? The fastest way to bring about change of the health care system would be to eliminate employer-based insurance and require everyone to purchase insurance on the open market, similar to or through uh, healthcare.gov. I echo Debbie. That is not, that would be quite devastating, especially since we have one insurer for Greene County. Um, I believe there are a lot of other avenues for change. Um, I believe that with making our healthcare system better on a statewide level, we could expand Medicaid to help people in that coverage gap actually have the healthcare they need. And we could all be more of a productive society if we are all doing okay. And yeah, I'm sorry, I get on a tangent with Medicaid. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think it's, I think it's gonna take a lot of conversations and, um, you know, it's not something that we can't really pull for on a statewide level with our state legislators. They can't make it happen. Um, but we need to keep talking about it with them and with our federal representatives. Okay. One thing I do wanna point out, we've got three million people that are provided insurance by their employers. Those are not all Centene or Ambetter. That's just for the folks who are individual, buying it through the healthcare.gov that are getting subsidies. Employer-based, group-based insurance, you can still get that through several different companies. Um, Rebecca, what impact has the impact has the lack of Medicaid expansion had on insurance premiums in Missouri? Any idea on that? Hmm. I'm not quite sure. So with Medicaid expansion, obviously there are a lot of people that are left out. Um, I think that there are, then there, and as a result, there are less people that are able to actually go for those plans. And so maybe that it may impact the variety of plans that people have. You may be more knowledgeable on this to answer that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, and I can't. Um, I can't give you exact numbers, but the less people on Medicaid makes the people who do buy in, like through healthcare.gov, so the more people who buy in, the lower the premiums are, because it broadens the, the base, like the pool. And so, so 
when you limit the pool, it means the people who get it are the people who need it and the people who use it, and that makes the prices go up. And so the less people we have accessing health care or health insurance and Medicaid, the higher the prices get. And so we're still paying for people who don't get Medicaid. Like people who don't get Medicaid don't go to their yearly checkup, right? But they do go to the emergency room when they're sick. And so that makes everyone's prices go up. Mm -hmm. So I don't have exact numbers, but I will say no, that. you're right. Thank no you. No matter what, the fact that we didn't expand Medicaid makes healthcare more expensive for all of us regardless. Like I, and, it, and the more narrow the pool is, doing things like taking away the individual mandate means people don't feel like they have to sign up so they don't, and then the people who do, because they need it, pay more. And then when they don't feel like they need it, Sometimes you do, and eventually you do. We don't all anticipate breaking our leg or doing any of that. And so it makes all of our prices go up. Because the hospitals have to recoup their money somehow. Right. And if they can't get it from the people who don't have insurance, they're gonna raise up the prices for the people who do have insurance. Um, again, Rebecca, one of the things I have, I have never understood was how Missouri is going to try and implement work requirements when Missouri is already a poor and state as far as Medicaid. In order to qualify for Medicaid, you have to be poor and pregnant, poor and a child, poor and elderly, poor and blind. You're probably not going to go to work. So how exactly, what was the plan as far as implementing work requirements for people who can't go to work? The plan was to kick people off of the Medicaid program. <laughs> I mean, plain and simple. Um, but yeah, I mean, most people who are on Medicaid who are able to work are working, you know. And so the idea that we need to implant, and I actually, Skylar, I brought a chart of the income requirements to get onto Medicaid. And actually, if you work a minimum wage job to meet those work requirements, Unless you have seven kids or more, you're priced out and you're kicked off of Medicaid. So these busy work requirements are just trying to keep people, keep people busy and that's it. So, <laughs> but yeah. I seem to recall that in other states, the work requirement was declared unconstitutional, <laughs> which would mean it would likely be unconstitutional here as well. Yes, yeah, you're thinking of Arkansas and Kentucky, I believe. So yeah, those are still in the courts, um, but we're hoping, that, um, we're hoping that that precedent that's being set by the fight that they're gonna have to give to try and get those passed is gonna be more of a deterrent as this is gonna be more trouble than it's worth. So yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you, Skylar, for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, Debbie, one for you just to change the pace. Yeah. So, I know you didn't sell a whole lot of health insurance before ACA, but... No, uh, bef well, the two years before, it was like zero. And my partner is like, our insurance numbers aren't any good. She's like, yeah, I haven't sold any plans this whole year. Um, but before that, like 20, 25 years ago, 15, 10 years ago, it was affordable and I could get people on. But a couple of years before, it just prices started going up a lot. So, uh, can you tell me what happened to your commission? before and after ACA? Um, before, we made pretty good money <laughs> selling health insurance, 10%, uh, 15% on you know $500 plans. But then after, it's not a percentage anymore, it's just a flat dollar amount per month, per person or per family. And part of the reason that change is because one of the requirements of the ACA was the, the how much of commission, or how much of the premium had to go to Actual health care? Exactly, 15%. 85%, and then 15% yeah. could be... 15 85, that's it. <laughs> that's about how things actually work. But, and so insurance companies, we're not going to give 10% to her and keep 5% for themselves. So that's one of the things that had changed. Yeah. Um, under the new Trump plans, I think it's like 20, 25, 30%. They would pay me a lot to sell those, but I can't do it in good conscience at all. They're just, they're a scam. If, if you really read them. Um, if you're riding a go-kart, it won't cover you. Riding a motorcycle, it won't cover you. Um, scuba diving, any, basically on, on the weekends, it won't cover you. Um, there, there's just so many things that are not covered at all. You gotta read that fine print. Um, and 
one of them, like I said, was you pay like the first $8,000 in expenses, and then it will pay $7,000 for a surgery, and then you pay the rest? It's like, really? With no, no caps on what you're out of pocket. The caps are all for the insurance companies to make as much money as possible. And Trump is right. There's a lot of competition in that area because they will make a lot of money selling those, and people will be left holding the back. Yeah, it's crazy. Anyone else have any questions? Otherwise, I'm just going to monopolize the mic here. I have this question. Yeah. I think it's because of money. <laughs> uh, does anyone address? Uh, why the commercial? Is, does anybody address these all these hours after hours of ads, expensive ads, we look every night by the pharmaceuticals? Because they make a lot of money. <laughs> so that, they actually sell it's all money. More medicine? Well, yeah, because ask your doctor about, now all of a sudden, everybody has whatever they have to ask their doctor about. Yeah, uh, we're all familiar with the VA. And my question is, are you aware of all of the problems that have been in the news over the years about the difficulties in the VA? And what do you think caused those problems? Rebecca, I think that one's for you. Basically, we already have a government-run health insurance or health plan um, through for, for veterans. And they've had a few problems if you've been paying attention to the news. So why is a Medicare for All plan going to be better? Um, well, with the two Medicare for All plans um, that are explicitly under that name, um, they actually maintain the VA. They haven't really touched too much from what I've seen with any changes. Um, but I have heard from someone close to me in town about having difficulties um, being able to get into the VA and having to travel until they just recently built that new one. Um, that's the extent of what I know just from what someone else has told me. But I'd love to learn more back about that. 20 years ago, back 20 years ago, you read in the paper how in, I think, New York City, there were rats running around the VA hospitals. My point is, you can have any program you want. If you underfund it, it's going to be miserable. And that's what the government tries to do with us, is they underfund programs because they want to skew the money off to something that they want to spend it on. So we're going to have trouble as long as we have a government-run system. But I don't know of a commercial-run system that would work at all. I mean, I don't think our commercial-run system is working as it is. No. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a difficult problem to deal with because mm -hmm. if you turn it over to the government, they'll get as much money out of it as they can and, and the individual will swing. I, I understand, but they're accountable to us. And part of the underfunding is something they can say it doesn't work. That's true. And then justify their That's true. That's true. I agree. Okay. All right. Yeah. And we could ask other countries how they successfully do their government run programs. And they do it well, and they have been doing it for decades. That's right. Some correct. over 100 mm -hmm. years. And we have a lot of nerve thinking we can't do it for our people. Well, and we do it for our people, and if we can't do it for our people, the people running it should get the hell out mm -hmm. and let us take care of it. I'm going to yeah. jump on that just a little bit. Part of the problem that we have in this country is we started with an employer based plan 60 years ago. If we had done um, single payer or socialized medicine or whatever you want to call it, back then it would be we'd have a lot more kinks worked out of it right now you have to rip up an existing infrastructure to put this in and rebecca do you have any idea on how many jobs would be lost with medicare who are in health insurance right now um, if we go to a, a medicare for all right right that's a very good consideration um, i um, don't have any numbers on all of those jobs lost but i really do believe and um, one of our partner organizations physicians for national health program has been having these discussions with labor unions for people who work in the administration with hospitals and stuff about what a transition for their employment could look like especially if we're all working with one system instead of thousands across the state. It'd be much simpler. Um, so I necessarily don't believe that these people are just going to be, you know, kicked out to the curb. 
one of the numbers I've seen on that was about a million people. Okay. 600,000. Well, there are two and a half people who work in insurance overall, but that includes guys like me who do home and, home and auto type stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you figure 25% of them are actually in health insurance, and then um, some more working with hospitals because they have to, because with a hospital only has one, one system to work with, they're not gonna have to have three people work on an insurance. Okay, just. Statistics say that about 20 million people either lose their job or change jobs every year anyway. It would be a bump. A lot of them are staying in the same career. Yeah, well, that, that may be true, but we don't, we don't um, support the mafia because we don't, we, we don't feel that. I bad. take offense to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. that is connected to Cox Hospital, mm -hmm. and I'm a little bit confused now. If some of these Medicare for All or whatever goes through, then does that mean my Advantage plan goes bye-bye, or could I continue with it, or what? Well, it depends on what goes through. Um, Mike, can you jump on that one? There's one sheet that we handed out. It's, it's uh, Democratic Proposals to Overhaul Healthcare at 2020 Primer. It takes four of those programs and analyzes a little bit. You know, everything's being kicked around right now, but there's, I guess, five programs now, we don't have the fifth one, that are actually fleshed out. So here's, here's a baseline for us to look at, and then we all just need to talk to our legislators and tell them what we want and follow it. And keep, I mean, I scour New York Times and CNN and all these places trying to find the latest information. I think that's what we're going to have to do. And then we're going to have to elect people who will even think about it. Things are going to change so much between now and 2020. And then by the time they actually get something in place, who knows what's going to happen. So the answer is, uh. I do have a great resource I found while researching these plans that has a side-by-side -side comparison with eligibility benefits. I will put it on our event page. Yes, sir. I wanted to make a comment about whether or not people overall are going to lose jobs. And unfortunately, using the employer-based model for insurance has been very destructive to business. First thing you have to do in business to stay in business is keep your costs down. And there isn't a place in town that doesn't employ four or five people or ten people or a hundred people who doesn't do a budget and find out that the first item on their budget is salaries. But what's the second item? Benefits. Health insurance. And it goes up every year, you pay more, you get less and compare that to Europe where employers have no health insurance coverage. They have higher taxes. Because it's paid for by the government, societal. And those people are at a real comparative advantage. So if you want to do something that would boost business and productivity and profits, get rid of the employer-based health insurance company system. Well, they're, they're, you're right. They're, they're not paying the premiums. They're paying the taxes to pay for the, to pay for the coverage. So, because taxes are going to have to go up to... I think earlier you said about 30, 35% of people who are eligible for Medicare are on supplemental plans right now. Yes or advantage plans and we may have a model right there that's not necessarily going to kill the whole private market but still keep medicare for all in place because if you have medicare as an opt-in program for any age person and let the private industry come in and compete against that as a baseline and give people the choice of either opting into medicare or going to at any age, Medicare Advantage plan. And, and those are, one of the options that are being discussed is instead of just doing away with employer-based entirely, let people decide if they want to go employer-based or they want to opt into Medicare. And then once you do that, you've got options, whether you go with a supplement or an Advantage plan. 
Oh, I saw another hand go up somewhere. Yeah, Jeff. Um, Rebecca, um, I know you're, you're not partisan in your work. Um, I'm just curious, you've likely met with a lot of legislators mm -hmm. this past session. I'm just curious as to your take on their level of concern because so many of them that I observe just really don't seem to care about this issue at all. They seem to push it aside and they want to spend their time working on other things. So I'm just curious what your take has been uh, yeah. on the legislators. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really do believe it's been a range, um, which would surprise people. Um, I think through um, our work at Missouri Healthcare for All and both like having in district meetings with these legislators and then, you know, going up to Jefferson City and saying, hey, remember me? You know, we're kind of building a relationship that's bigger than just, you know, we want you to think our way and if not, that sucks. Um, so I've really noticed that there are some who actually sell insurance and who are very against the kind of consumer protections that would take money away from their pockets. There are those legislators. Um, but there are also those who will sit down and are super psyched to meet with us that we came up all this way. And after talking about it a couple times, have seen the benefit of some of our policy positions. So, yeah. Jeff, your question is what my nightmares are made of. Um, if, if there's nothing to buy, I mean, I'm already freaking worried about that. If there's nothing to buy, I might have to leave Missouri or get um, an address at my parents' house in Kansas or something, or a boyfriend in Arkansas, or do something. I cannot be without health insurance. And like I said, for any price, if there's nothing for me to buy, um, or try and figure out a job that would cover me through a job or something, because I'm basically retired or self-employed, and there's so many people like me, and not everybody's losing sleep and having nightmares over this, but um, because I think they don't realize there's one option. In next October, if Ann Better says we're not going to be in Missouri anymore, nobody else is coming into Missouri on the Affordable Care Act. It doesn't look like it's not like expanding where everybody's because the the profit limits are so tight. It's 15 percent. Everything has to go to the 15 percent. 85 percent has to be paid out in claims. So yeah, the, it, it's huge to somebody like me. But in Jeff City, they're like, well, whatever. And I, I want to jump on that just a little bit because Anthem was in all states in Missouri. Then when Centene came in, Anthem pulled out of the areas that's, that that Centene was coming to. They that split. Anthem. Yeah, they split the state. Yeah. So you're right. An um, Anthem so if Anthem is half the state right now, right. and Ann better is half. Right. There's no competition and, and, anywhere. Exactly. What you got? And I, I want to echo what you're saying because I, I, I was a navigator for several years mm -hmm. and um, the vast majority of the people I enrolled were people who retired early. Mm -hmm. Were people who quit working at 60, 62, 62 waiting for Medicaid or one, one of the spouses was on Medi Medicare and one wasn't. And so I think in our heads everyone thinks of these kids who are like waiting tables and not making money and that's it's not that's not who's benefiting from the affordable care it's people who need that health care yeah young healthy people and that's the issue yeah because if young healthy people are signing up the prices would be skyrocketing so it is people who are older are using it and are are, are in desperate need for it yeah they took the mandate well that's one thing though that i forgot to say on the mandate and like i said i've been doing i've had people say if it was ten dollars more for the entire year for the mandate, or if the insurance was $10 more than the mandate, they'd say, I'm not getting my insurance. It wasn't as much of an incentive as we'd all hoped it would be. You know what? It cost more, in my opinion. So. I didn't lose one client due to the mandate. You know, and everybody's like, well, I had got to buy it. It's like, no, no, you do not have to buy it anymore. Oh, well, I still want it. Did not lose yeah. one client. Every single person that I helped wanted it. So, it. yeah, they and need it. it yeah. 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 Okay, we're at 7:30. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we are planning to have a Medicaid expansion uh, town hall in August, um, and some of the issues that we brought up today, we're going to be talking about again in more depth. Um, Missouri is losing out on a lot of money, be and let's be honest, it's because the legislature does not like Barack Obama. The end. That's the reason. Um, they're costing, okay, yeah, 
you and I will talk after the meeting rather than use, use my mic for a soapbox. But again, thank you very much for coming. We're coming at the end of the uh, last Wednesday of every month is when we're doing this. Next month we'll be right here talking about labor and labor rights. Um, June 26th. Thank you very much. And there's a couple of Good reading there, but if you, you might look and see if there's anything you missed.